it is great having you for our closing session. It is my honor and privilege to introduce one of my absolute favorite people in San Antonio, our first lady, Erica Prosper Nuremberg. Erica Nur Prosper Nuremberg grew up in a migrant worker family in the Rio Grande Valley, and she currently serves as the Senior Director of Customer Insight at HEB. She has served as chairwoman and board member of the San Antonio Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and on the boards of SACI Youth Arts, the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation, SACRD.org, the Girl Scouts of Southwest Texas Board and Las Casas Foundation, and is part of the advisory board for I Am Power and SA League of Women Voters. She has received too many awards to name here today, but her proudest honor was receiving the 2010 Association of Migrant Educators of Texas's Migrant Alumni Award. Much of her passion revolves around efforts to help improve quality of life for all San Antonians, especially underserved populations through girls and women empowerment, education, and literacy. It is my honor to present to you Erica Prosper Nuremberg. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Diaz. Um, first of all, let me thank everyone who has joined us today. Um, it is a big, uh, big honor to be here, primarily because um, everything that you stand for, the idea of resiliency, the idea of moving forward, is something that's very dear to my heart, and I'll share that story with you. But more importantly, it's dear to me as First Lady. One of the things that I've always loved um, for the last seven years that I've been able to be your First Lady is the show of resilience um, and the show um, of ganas, as they say, that San Antonio shows. So for me, it's really important. Now I'm gonna ask for your patience because I am getting over the flu. Today is really my last day um, at home, but I have, como les dije, I have the sexy voice. So um, I have a little cough drop. So please forgive me if on occasion I suck on the cough drop. But I wanna start first by thanking everyone who put this together. There's not a lot of spaces where you can go and you can be honest and open about not just the trauma that you've suffered, but also what is next and what should come next. And I've been asked to speak primarily because um, of the fact that I do come from an interesting story um, that is not too dissimilar from many stories that you hear. And when I was asked to talk about how do you build resilience, how do you build resilience from tragedy, so that our families and our communities can move forward. I was very touched by the idea, but I also thought, where does resiliency start? And as I, as I thought about where resiliency started, I thought about, well, what makes me who I am? What makes you who you are? Who are the people that made you who you are? Because sometimes resiliency can come from them. Where are the places you've been? Not just where you've lived, but where you've worked. Sometimes you can borrow resiliency or safety from those areas. And finally, what's your history? What's your history? Not just you personally or your families, but you as a culture. Because I think sometimes we overlook, we overlook how much our culture has also affected us in good ways and in bad ways. Because we're all tied to that story. We're all tied to the history and the places and the people that make us who we are. And no matter what we do, resiliency is part of that narrative. I wanna start first because it is Hispanic Heritage Month. And I don't think we talk about this enough. I wanna talk first about our collective story as Latinos, at least mine. That story of the Hispanic and quite frankly, most immigrant nations, it's rooted and grounded in survival. Hispanic specifically had roots in the indigenous. We're descendants of the first humans that came over from Asia over 12,000 years ago. Think about that. Over 12,000 years ago, if you're a Latino or Latina, you have that gene. You have that genetic disposition, a first human to survive. Our history also shows us that we got Spanish independence. And over 300 years ago, more than five actually, 100 years ago, we came from a story of survival through conquest. And the ultimate aspects of racism, whether it was color or language or color and country of origin that were faced after that. Now I bring this up 
mostly because, again, you have to understand the story you come from. Grounded in survival, surviving the natural elements, surviving rebellion, surviving what would become eventually in the United States a class apart or continuous pressures. But most importantly, you come from a story that is grounded in survival because no matter what was done to diminish the light of your culture, it has not only survived, but thrived, becoming one in every sixth United States citizen, becoming two of every fifth person in Texas, and becoming three of every five people in San Antonio and Bear County. So I want to start today by talking specifically about that, that our story collectively is grounded already in survival. But more importantly, our story is elevated by action. A lot of the reason that Latinos, San Antonians, Texans, a lot of the reason why we continue to thrive is because we do not sit idly by. I doubt that anyone who is listening here is sitting idly by, or you wouldn't be at this conference trying to understand how to move forward. But I wanna remind you again, that part of the civil rights movement that happened in the 60s was extremely elevated by the presence of San Antonio. In fact, San Antonio itself was the birthplace of what many think is the original Chicano civil rights movement right over on the west side at Our Lady of the Lake. When in 1968, a congressional hearing on the state of Mexican Americans took place. And after that hearing, that is when President Johnson declared that Hispanic Heritage Week should be honored nationally. It would eventually become the month in the 80s. But from that coalition also came the realization that Mexican Americans in the United States were not being treated equal. And that took action on the part of people who testified about their survival of racism, their experiences, in traumas by being denied homes, bank accounts. All of that to tell you that our culture, your roots have been elevated by action every single day and significantly by what was done in the 1960s. It's propelled by courage too because it took courage for many of those people to not just come forward, but it took courage from people all over the country to come forward and talk about their experiences. Many of you know Silvia Mendes, who got the Congressional Medal of Honor from President Obama because she was the child whose parents sued against school desegregation in 1947. It took courage for her parents who were not educated, who could not speak English to come forward and sue in order for their child to go to school. It took courage for Mario Molina, the Mexican chemist who discovered the hole in the ozone layer to come forward and say, we've got to stop what we're doing. He would eventually get a Nobel prize. And it took courage for teachers to understand that children were being left behind and started the little school of 400. That yes, again, inspired President Johnson to start the Head Start program of which I am a graduate of. Now you're probably wondering why I'm starting with a history lesson, but I'm starting with that because I think that one of the most important questions we have to ask ourselves is what is our story? But oftentimes we leave out where we come from beyond just our family or our grandparents. And it matters to me that all of you here know that you're a survival not just because of what you did and the courage you had, but because you come from a culture propelled by action and a culture that knows how to survive. It is in you. But the big question is, what do you do with that? What do you do when you know deep down inside you have to survive? When you know that you have to take action, when you know that it takes courage to do it? What happens next? Your story is shaped, like I said, by the people that are around you. Mine was greatly shaped 
by a beautiful woman named Abundia Tafoya de Lopez. My grandmother, who is 100 years old, she is still alive, and yes, she is still like telling me I'm not a good enough wife sometimes. <laughs> but I think what I need to share with you is that she was, is the love of my life. She and my son. Ron is in there too, guys, but she shaped me. She gave me courage. She gave me a lust for life. But unfortunately, she also gave me early ideas that it was okay to be hit. I watched my grandfather. I watched him attack her as a child. I watched my uncles take him off of her. As I grew up, I would watch my uncles repeat his actions and hit their wives. I still will not forget the day that one of my uncles hit his new bride. They were barely married about a month. Hit her so hard, he knocked her teeth out. She still wears a bridge. So as wonderful as my grandmother is, and as much as I love her, and as much as she literally helped shape me, I never realized how her telling me by her actions that it was okay to be hit was something I grew up with. It was normal for my grandmother to chase us with a manguera or a switch when we were doing bad things. It was normal for my uncles to take off their belts and hit us. In fact, it was very normal to just expect violence in my home. And I looked to her, I looked to my mother, I looked to other women in my life to see why this didn't feel right with me and yet they were okay with it. Now, I don't pass judgment on them. They come from a different generation. They came from a very different educational system and they definitely came from a very, very different mindset. But it wasn't until I was probably in my teens that I started to vocalize how this did not feel normal. Because when I would go to school and I would hear people talk about their families and the get togethers on the weekends, I didn't hear fighting. I didn't hear violence. I didn't hear all these things that was normal for me. And so one of the best things that I can tell you about resilience is that it really does start with one question sometimes, and that is questioning that need for survival. So I questioned, I started asking, why do you let them hit you? And when my aunts couldn't give me a really good answer, when they would just give me quest answers like, well, it's just the way it is, or, oh, you know how it is, or, oh, they're drunk, I started to realize, wait a minute, this isn't normal. When my grandmother would chase me and I would eventually stop and face her and say, why are you hitting me? It would make her stop and think. Wouldn't stop her sometimes, but it would make her stop and think, why am I hitting her? I would eventually put my hand up and say, no, you will not hit me. And that's how it started. Because the resilience sometimes has to start with the resistance. That's why it's important for us to know our history and know that we come from a history of resistance. But she as a person shaped me and I took that to heart. And as I raised my son, I made a promise. I would never raise my hand to him. And I have raised a child who does not know what violence is. I do raise my voice and yes, Sometimes, I'm not joking, it just goes up automatically and I realize it and I actually grab my hand and put it down. It's not perfect. When you grow up in that environment, when you grow up so immersed in it, it's part of you. I don't know if many of you know this, but I had to become adopted at a later age. I had to leave my home at 17 because my mother, under the influence of alcohol, beat me so bad that my teachers had to actually report it and I was taken out of my home. That would start a separate journey of education and a whole separate journey of family 
and a very interesting background that I now have. But I share this with you because it wasn't just something I saw. It was something I experienced and it was life changing for me. But what mattered more than anything else was that at that time I had already resisted. I had already started to question and I had already made conscious decisions that I needed violence out of my life. And as hard as it was, and by circumstance, I was taken out of that. Now, many people who are listening don't have that option or maybe didn't have that option and that's okay. By the grace of God, something happened that changed my life. But it wasn't just God alone. I put up my hands. I said no. I understood that it mattered to resist. And it wouldn't matter how many times and how many chasings or how many chanclas. The point being that I resisted. Because that's how it starts. The minute you resist, you start to be resilient. Now, the second thing that affected me are the places I've been. Had I stayed in the bubble of my home, like I told you, I don't know where I would end up. I really don't. I was an intelligent child. I had a lot, a lot of good grades. I had a lot of potential, but I was still very tied to my family. And I don't know whether or not if I had not been taken out of the family, I would have eventually gone away to college to Austin and then to Philadelphia. I don't know if I would have dared for the kind of career I had that made me wait on having children instead of having them early. I don't know. But when I see my sisters who didn't get out of that, two of them went down the path that my aunts did. Got married early, had children early, put up with violence. The youngest one who saw me go to college, who saw me move out of that situation, who saw me from a very young age say no, She's a CPA. She went to college. She's a single mother, but she does not want or need for anything. So those places that surround you are just as important. Putting yourself out of those situations is just as important to building up that resilience. Because it isn't just the people sometimes we've got to move out from. It's the places, the friendships, the circumstances. Like I said, I was blessed that I was old enough that the next logical step for me was to move out to go to college, to go to a whole different mindset and a whole different way of living. But it's important for you to understand that if you separate yourself from the people that are keeping you from being resilient and moving forward, you have to consider also separating yourself from the places and the circumstances. Again. I don't pass judgment. I don't pass judgment on my sisters. They didn't have the chance I did. They weren't taken out. They had to stay there. But I know deep down inside that had they had the opportunity, they probably would have had a very different life. So as I think about your story and as I think about how you can be shaped moving forward, I also think about what I've chosen to include in my life, the friendships, the hobbies, the, 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 the workspaces. I've chosen three things in my life that have made a difference towards my resilience. The first, that resistance eventually grew into what I call a growth mindset. And that is a mindset that doesn't look at failures or my past or my, or my traumas, or my abuses as a reason to stop, but instead looks at them as learning opportunities and things that I can now choose to say no to and stay away from. A growth mindset allows you to look at those not as failures that will pull you down, but as a natural part of your story that is going to push you forward. A growth mindset allows for you to have compassion towards yourself, compassion to others, but most importantly, it allows for you to be okay with stumbling as you make your way through that resilience. The second thing that has made it possible for me in my life has been that I chose a partner 
who doesn't look at me as somebody who has to obey and do what he says. I've chosen a partner who looks at me as an equal, and sometimes even better than him, but as an equal, more importantly. And as a man who also agrees that violence is not a solution for any kind of confrontation. Choose those friends, choose those partners. Together we teach our son the same thing. Everyone knows about when you're teaching a child, use your words. We've literally brought up a child who uses his words and sometimes unfortunately he uses it to get too much out of us. But we also know that he's a child who recognizes that violence isn't good and who recognizes that he needs to stand up to it when he sees it. And finally, the third thing, that has helped my resilience is that I have become more proud of my culture, more proud of my story, more proud of my heritage than I have ever been because I now know where I come from, from people that invented zero, from people that created pyramids before Egypt, from people that were masters in architecture. I come from a heritage of prosperity, I come from a heritage of honor. And sometimes when you're at your lowest, knowing just that is enough. So if you think about adding a growth mindset to your life, you can look it up on the internet. It's everywhere. Growth mindset, and it'll teach you more. If you think about surrounding yourself, surround yourself with people who look at the joy in you and at the positives in you and also agree that violence is not the way to interact or have a relationship. And if you ever question yourself, don't think you can do it. Know that you come from a heritage of survival, of action and of courage. And know that you're living in that heritage right now if you live here as well. I wanna thank you all. I'm gonna leave a little few minutes in case of questions. Because I want to make sure that just in case any of you have questions, um, that you get to ask them of me. I'm an open book, but I appreciate it so much. I appreciate you taking the time to be here with me. And I want you to always know you, you can re have resilience from resistance. And you can have resilience from your heritage. And you can have resilience from the people that surround you. Thank you. So I don't know if anyone wants to ask me questions. I don't know if you have them in the chats or if anyone wants to come back online and ask me questions. Maybe not. Thank you so, so much. Are you hearing an echo or just me? It's just you. Okay. Uh, what a powerful testimony. Uh, and some of this is the first time that I've heard you share your story, uh, Erica. And it's just a reminder um, as we continue to do this work that we truly have all in some form or fashion uh, been impacted by domestic violence and by how, that, how we allow that to change our lives is up to us to a great extent and you have empowered us with your voice uh and empowered all of our viewers uh to hopefully take that message back home to whoever needs to hear it uh that we can do something to break the cycles of abuse uh and to strengthen uh, our resiliency uh, for ourselves and for our community and so I'm, I'm just so grateful to have heard your testimony today uh, and really appreciate you being here with us. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much uh, for being here. Um, and a special thanks to you, uh, Judge Diaz. Um, these aren't conversations that are easy to have. What makes me hopeful, honestly, though, is that I think we're embarking on a whole new generation that understands not just that mental wellness is important, but that having these open conversations about trauma is really critical to who we are and how to move forward. The fact of the matter is, if I hadn't asked those questions of my family, if I hadn't asked why this happens, none of them would have taken a step back to understand why this wasn't normal um, and why I would be asking the questions. I'm happy to say that um, I have a great relationship with all of my birth family now. We talk openly 
about behavior that in the past was not healthy. My uncles themselves have also talked openly about behavior. Not all of them have changed, unfortunately, but you know, the point is that if you don't actually talk about it and resist it, you can't actually change anything. So I'm really happy that you and everybody involved in this conference and symposium is able to show that resistance by just simply talking openly. So again, I'm really hopeful because I do believe the next generation that's coming for before, after us, excuse me, really has an open idea of why discussing trauma, sorry, has an idea of why discussing trauma openly is a healthy thing. Can you expand on higher education institutions can break the cycle of abuse? You know, it's interesting because um, I think my biggest challenge um, as I was younger was that everyone, everybody always told me, esto es de la casa, this is private stuff, it's not to be shared. And the only other place I really ever spent a lot of time with was at school. So it was almost kind of, it was so difficult for me to walk a tightrope of, I can't say anything at the place where I am pretty much most of the day, you know, about what's happening with the other place I am most of the day. I think what higher institutions can do is I think they can open the doors by continuing to do some of the things that I've heard uh, people do, like having survivor groups, openly talking about traumas, saying over and over, domestic abuse is not normal. If someone is hitting you, if there is violence in your relationship, that is not normal. I think a lot of times young people are looking towards institutions and others to normalize, to tell them what is normal, right? Just like we teach kids how to take notes, normalizing how to take good notes, we should teach them to normalize healthy relationships as well. And I think education, especially higher education areas, have the right to do that because the mental health of your students and the physical health of your students is just as important to them getting an education as it is towards in their grades, as it is towards what they're learning. So I think that holistic point of view of relationship health and normalizing relationship health is something that higher, uh, uh, higher ed uh, areas have a lot of runway to work with. I couldn't agree more with that. And, and Erica, that is something that we're working on through the CCDV as well. So folks are, are aware. Uh, we do have um, representatives from our institutions of higher education. And one of our initiatives this year is working with our, our local superintendents uh, to uh, establish a, a protocol and a process by which we can be sure we're reaching out to our families to give them the resources they need and to teach them what healthy relationships are and are not. Uh, so that was a great question. Uh, and we appreciate the, the work that you have done to support our efforts. Of course, the work that um, Mayor Nuremberg, uh, your husband, has done to support our efforts as well. Uh, and if there's any more questions, folks, we've got about two minutes left uh, of uh, Erica's time. We'd be happy to take questions from folks. As we wait for questions, um, you know, one thing that I think is really difficult for younger students as I think about your ISDs um, is that there's a lot of shame sometimes associated, right? Because at that age, you're comparing yourself so much to your peers. Um, and I think there's a lot of shame. I felt a lot of shame as a young person, as a, as a teenager, because um, I somehow felt like I would be ostracized. Um, and I wouldn't have friends and people would think of me as a weirdo or, or oh, a bad person. Like that shame, that badness was going to be on me. I, I think for a younger person, the strategy um, might be to, a, a gentler touch to make sure that you continue to invest in counselors. You continue to invest in people that where someone can go behind a closed door and have that conversation and have that private session. Because I don't I think it's different. I think when you're in college. To a certain degree, you're there to find yourself. You're there to open yourself up and change your direction. But I think when you're still in high school or, or junior high or even younger, you know, you're there as a, to learn as a solace, sometimes even to escape. So you don't want to bring that with you. So I think there's got to be a very different aspect when I think about ISDs. Um, I think the the notion of escaping it is is a starting point. But how do you not just provide a, a, a way to escape, but how do you then provide the counseling and the support emotionally that a child might need to not feel the shame? I think shame is a big one when, when we're younger. 
Amen to that, Erica. We need to be sure that we are providing all of those social supports as well to our children in order to break those generational cycles of abuse. And once again, we are so grateful for your uh, for your sharing your wisdom with us and your time. And uh, if there are any other questions, we'll send them your way and perhaps get those answered after the symposium is done. Sounds good. Thank you again. I appreciate it and um, have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye, Erica. Bye. All right, folks, uh, we have reached the end of our fourth annual CCDV Domestic Violence Awareness Symposium. I want to thank a few folks uh, that were critical to making this symposium happen. First and foremost, a huge thanks to University Health, who sponsored this entire event and has done so for the last four years. We are eternally grateful for their support through all of our efforts in the CCDV and their financial support for the symposium. Thank you to George Hernandez and his incredible team at University Health. We also, uh, I would like to acknowledge and thank my co-chair, Deputy City Manager Maria Villa Gomez, and her entire team, the city of San Antonio itself, uh, but her team Team Erica Haller Stevenson and Rick Giprich as well, who have made this possible. And then on on my side of the CCDV, the county side, I would like to acknowledge Bear County for supporting our efforts and our incredible team as well. Noah Fuentes, our CCDV coordinator, and our interns, Maddie Wills and Sonia Beatrice, were all behind the scenes making this symposium as seamless uh, as possible for all of you. So I thank our incredible team. And last but not least, we thank you. Thank you for your time, for being here today. This would not be possible without you. We hope uh, that you have learned everything you were hoping to get out of this and that you're able to take that back to your workplaces, your families, your neighborhoods, share the knowledge, break down those barriers, break down the stigma of talking about domestic violence and share with others what you have learned. In particular, if you know someone that is experiencing uh, violence right now, be sure that you share some of the important resources that we provided. Make sure they know that in San Antonio, we have set it up so that individuals can call or text 911. If they are not in a position to pick up the phone and call, they can text 911 in an emergency situation. Uh, be sure to remind folks about the importance of creating a safety plan. We've provided you those resources. We'll drop them in the chat again. You can reach out to Family Violence Prevention Services uh, to create a safety plan. You can also call SAPD's non-emergency number to increase your safety while in a violent uh, home or relationship and to increase your safety when you are ready to leave that uh, situation. Uh, remember, folks, October is Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and the uh, City of San Antonio and Bear County formally recognize uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. One of the ways we do so is we uh, all participate in the Purple Porch Campaign, which is a national campaign that we also participate in here in San Antonio. We encourage you all to join us in the Purple Porch Campaign and to switch your light bulbs out on your porches for purple light bulbs or simply decorate your porches with purple uh, banners or wreaths to indicate to folks that you are uh, standing uh, taking a stand against domestic violence, that you're willing and ready to talk about it and to break down that stigma and support those who have experienced uh, domestic violence in their lifetime. So join us in the Purple Porch campaign, help us prevent and reduce domestic violence. And lastly, if you wanna learn more about the CCDV, we hosted this symposium. It's the Collaborative Demi Commission on Domestic Violence. We've been around since 2019. We've done a lot of work. The symposium is just one of the many things we do every year. You can learn all about our work at ccdv.org. Please also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and X, formerly known as Twitter. You can learn all about what we're doing there and keep up with uh, our events uh, and learn about next year's symposium as well. So thank you all once again. That's a wrap, folks. We will have these recordings up on YouTube for you shortly, and we'll send you an email with uh, information on how to get CLE, CEU credit, and how to access these videos later. Thanks, everyone. Bye.